Chapter 2 Sirens blared as the pilots rushed to their fighters. Among them was Ensign Susan Nightingale. Susan had just graduated from the academy last week. Even though she had extensive fighter pilot training, she couldn't keep her excitement down. All throughout the academy, she had been just average. Most of her grades were slightly above average, but nothing special, except for one thing. Susan had been captain of the Academy's advanced flight team and had excelled at piloting and light ship operations. She had been hoping to get posted on the Saratoga, an experimental faster than light ship with a hyper jump drive, but right now she didn't want to be anywhere other than here. She climbed into her fighter and she slipped the fighter helmet over her long light brown hair. She felt a tingling in her left eye as the helmet scanned her iris. In front of her eyes, on the helmet visor, displayed the words, Scan complete. Welcome, Ensign Susan Nightingale. Suddenly, the screen changed to a tactical heads-up display, showing her not only her ship's engine output, weapon status, and the like, but would also show her the estimated trajectory of up to three targeted objects, be they ships, asteroids, or the target drones they had used for target practice. The ship was a very sleek design adapted from alien technology, the same technology that was used in the building of the station. The cockpit was located about eight feet above the ground. On either side of the cockpit was a curved wing, which curved backwards, sloping to reach the ground about ten feet behind the cockpit. Behind the cockpit was the engine, an alien design, which had been designated a Graviton Thrust Drive, or GTD for short. On the front of the wings sat two medium-sized pulse cannons, each about five feet long. The pulse cannon was just about the only thing on the fighter that was not adapted from alien tech. It was completely human in design. The cannon was designed to release powerful bursts of energy in rapid-fire pulses. It was powerful enough to blast small asteroids to dust, but only at close range. The further away the target, the less damage it does. As she engaged the engines and powered up the weapon system, Susan began to get a bit nervous. This was real. She was about to go into a real battle. Her heart pounded inside her chest. As she engaged the final startup sequence, the hangar bay began to decompress and a voice came over the speaker in her helmet. This is Commander George Skimore. As you all know, we are about to engage an alien attack force in defense of the four colonies. Ensign Durham is working on a way to disable the enemy ship's shields, but until then, we can only hope that our own shields hold out. Good luck and Godspeed. Skimore out. The shuttle bay doors began to rise. As they did, Susan pressed the launch release button on her panel. Her fighter began to shake and then hovered above the floor. The rest of the fighters in the bay did likewise. Once the bay doors had been fully opened, the fighters closest to the door engaged their GTD and left the hangar. Soon after, the next row did likewise, and then the next. Finally, it was Susan's squad's turn to leave. She pressed down on the lever next to her seat, and her fighter began to move quickly. She took over the controls. And as she left the hangar bay, she couldn't help but think that this could be the last time she would set foot on stable ground. But that thought soon left her as she formed up with her squad. All right, boys, let's kick some alien ass! She yelled over the comm as she took up position in the lead of the formation with the other five ships. Two on either side in a V-shape and one directly behind her. On her tactical display, she could see the first group of enemy fighters closing in. As they got closer and closer, Susan turned off the safety on her weapons, and the starfield blazed with weapons fire. The team of six people walked toward the evacuation tunnel. The tunnel, which had been built as an evacuation route to New Haven from the surface, was approximately 50 feet across and nearly six miles long. For the past hundred years, it had been sealed off so that nobody would go back up. As they approached the tunnel, the team began to suit up. They put on their environmental suit, or EV suit, which had a built-in oxygen tank and a light source on the helmet. The EV suits were gray-colored and made of a rubbery material. They were fitted to their individual wearer and could sustain that individual for nearly a day before running out of oxygen. 
Most of the helmet was opaque, but the front was clear, allowing the wearer to see out. As they put their suits on, they began to discuss their mission. What if there are still people on the surface, like the stories say? Sergeant Walker was one of two security people assigned to the mission. Having been specially trained in close combat, Lucas was also assigned to the defense of the technical expert, Dr. Matfield. That's ridiculous. The likelihood of something surviving the radiation for a hundred years is so small that it's practically impossible. Being the oldest person on the team, Dr. Matfield was also the chief radiologist. The doc's right. If we encounter any kind of life, it'll either be plant life or fungus. Sergeant Dawkins was the second of the two security personnel assigned to the team. His training in long-range combat would be, in the unlikely event of an attack, a real asset. Besides, if there are any hostiles, they'll have to get past my plasma rifle before they get to you. There's no point speculating on what might happen. Let's just get the job done, said Sergeant Harper, the team's mechanical specialist with a street degree in electrical and mechanical engineering, as well as strategic combustibility. Of course, if we do get attacked by something, I suspect you'll just blow it up anyway, retorted Sergeant Jones, the team's tactical analyst. Being trained in military and non-military tactics, she could prepare them for any possibility. Well, if you all are done chattering, we have a job to do. And let's get it done safely as we can. I don't want to have to sign anyone's death certificate because they tripped and fell into a radiation pit, replied Lieutenant Williams sarcastically. John was the leader of the team. His job was to keep the team working and to make sure they are doing their assigned tasks as efficiently as possible. Once they each had their suits on, except for their helmets, and had been given radiation treatments just in case, they began to walk up to the exit of the dome. A crowd had gathered around the massive steel door blocking the tunnel. The door had been placed on a timer that would release the lock on the door after 100 years. As they approached the crowd that had gathered around the entrance for the monumental event, John and his team were faced with the realization that everyone in New Haven would be watching them. A large countdown clock had been placed near the exit to the underground city to count down to the exact time that the doors would unlock. As the clock reached the five minute mark, a news crew approached the team. Lieutenant Williams, the reporter began her planned on-site interview. You and your team have been training for the past year to prepare for this moment. Now that it's here, is there anything that you would like to say to the people of New Haven? Even though he had known for a while that he would have to speak, he never actually planned what he would say. A hundred years ago, John began, our civilization was on the edge of a golden era. An era that was cut short by the catastrophe that devastated our planet's surface. Today, we embark on a journey to see if we can return to the surface. If all goes well, we will give our children a chance to experience life on the surface of the planet and a chance to begin to rebuild that golden era. The crowd cheered as even John himself was surprised at how good his words sounded. Thank you, Lieutenant, the reporter said politely. John and his team continued to the entrance of the evacuation tunnel and waited as time ticked down. At one minute until the clock reached zero, the crowd started cheering wildly. With mere seconds left on the clock, the final countdown began. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5. Time seemed to slow as the last five seconds were counted off. 4, 3, 2. John's heart seemed to pause just before the last second. 1. Everyone went dead silent as they stared at the door. Nothing seemed to happen. Everyone held their breath for a moment. What if the lock timer in the door is broken? John thought. This could all be for nothing. Suddenly, a loud click came from the door. Then another, and then a slight hissing as the door cracked open. As the crowd cheered, the team put on their helmets and began their long ascent to the surface. In my sight, in my sights. I've got a bogey on my six! I can't shake him! I got him! I'm dead! There's too many of them! The communication channel was full of voices. Pilots in the midst of combat screamed into their helmet microphones. Many of these young men and women would never return to the space station. Susan Nightingale was one of the best pilots assigned to the station. 
Her fighter was twisting and turning throughout the battle. Her pulse cannons fired with blazing pulses of bright white energy. Hang on, Nova 6, she called over the comm to the target of the ship she was tailing. I've almost got him! Her console beeped, signifying a target lock. She pressed her triggers, firing rapidly at the enemy ship. The enemy ship's shields absorbed most of the bursts, but two got through, damaging the enemy's engine and port wing. The enemy ship curved aside. Another human fighter blasted at the alien ship as it turned, causing massive damage to its hull. The ship exploded in a riot of color. Thanks, Solo Leader, a voice said over the comm. I owe you one. Two more alien fighters converged on Susan's ship. I've got two bogeys on my port flank. Request assistance. I've got you covered. A softer voice replied over the comm. Half a second later, a human fighter flew across the top of Susan's ship, pulse cannons blazing, damaging the cockpit of one of the alien ships, causing it to spin out of control. The other ship fired several plasma bursts at Susan's ship. Her ship's starboard wing ripped off as the plasma bursts impacted on it. I've lost my starboard maneuvering thruster and pulse cannon, she yelled over the comm. I'm not sure how much longer I can hold on. Her ship began to spin out of control as two more plasma bursts collided with it. I don't think I'm going to make it, she stated. Just then, a large vessel hyper jumped in just above her. Her ship was pulled toward the jump vortex with such momentum that she didn't have time to react. As her fingers flew over the controls, trying to keep from getting pulled in, the last thing she saw was nearly a hundred more alien fighters being launched from the newly arrived mothership. Then she was hurtling down a jump vortex, faster than light, toward the place from which the mothership had come. Less than a second passed in the vortex. Soon, Susan's ship was hurling through space. A planet was visible off where her starboard wing would have been. The acid clouds covered nearly a quarter of the planet's surface, but the continents were still clearly recognizable. She was heading straight towards Earth. Looking around, Susan saw something terrifying. Off to the side of the planet, halfway to the moon, two more alien motherships were orbiting the planet. Closing her eyes, she prayed silently, God help us all, and then she passed out. The surface team was walking up the shaft and talking to each other as they did with more speculation and jabs at each other. After walking for about two hours and descending four miles a little over halfway, they had run out of jokes and speculative chatter. Around this time, the air began to feel heavier as the ventilation system in New Haven made the air slightly lighter than normal, causing it to be a bit harder to breathe near the surface. All right, team, let's take a break, John suggested. They stopped walking and sat down for a bit. The surface team sat in silence, unable to think of anything to talk about. John's mind wandered to when he first met his team. It had been just over a year ago when he had been selected to lead the team. He had spent days sifting through nearly a hundred suitable applicants. In the end, he settled on these five people. The team's radiologist was the easiest to choose. There were only 10 people who had the necessary credentials for the position, and Dr. Matfield was the only one with a doctorate. He had met the doctor several times previously, and knew that, while he could be overly pompous at times, he knew more about his field than anyone. Sergeant Jones and Dawkins may have not been the absolute best in their respective fields, but they were the ones who worked best together. Having grown up together, the two knew how each other thought, which would be a great asset in the field. Because of this, the two sergeants had gained the nickname The Twins, even though they weren't actually related. The first time John had met the twins, they were bickering over who would press the elevator buttons to get to the cafeteria in the NHDO building. Ever since he knew them, the two had always teased each other, sometimes even to the point of playing practical jokes on each other. Despite this, they worked really well together and always had each other's backs. John had grown up in the same neighborhood as Sergeant Lucas Walker, though they spent very little time together. Lucas spent most of his time either studying or in martial arts classes. Walker had a black belt in karate, as well as extensive training in other close quarters fighting, including fencing, wrestling, and boxing. He was one of the best choices as a security guard for the team. John had decided to assign Walker to the defense of the technical expert, Dr. Matfield. The last member of his team was Michael Harper. Despite John's insistence that a demolitions expert shouldn't be needed on an information-gathering mission, the higher-ups overruled him. 
Harper was a bit of a mystery to John. He had grown up in the lower class area of the city, had a pretty lengthy arrest sheet, mostly for arson, and had even spent some time in the rehabilitation center for destructive behavior. He was recruited into the NHDO as part of his rehabilitation and had excelled at what he called constructive destruction, which mostly included blowing up debris that had blocked off some of the tunnels to outlying food processing farms. Being the only applicant for the demolitions position and being recommended by his overseers, Harper was assigned to the team. After listening to their own thoughts for a while, they started walking again. As they reached the surface of the planet, the survey team was amazed at the brightness of the sun. No human in a hundred years had seen the real sunlight. Wow, exclaimed Sergeant Walker. It sure is bright. It's about twice the luminosity of the sun globe at noon, John stated. Just don't look straight at it and you'll be fine. The scenery was very sparse. There were no trees, only rocks, dirt, and debris. New Haven had been built under an old U.S. military base somewhere in the former state of Nevada. Apparently, the base was destroyed during the disaster. All that was left of it was some rubble and dust. They kept walking for about half an hour when they came upon a clearing. Here looks like a good spot to set up the RDS, Lieutenant, remarked Dr. Matfield. All right, team, let's set up camp here too, John suggested. It took them about 20 minutes to set everything up. When they were done, the Radiation Detection System, or RDS, was about three and a quarter feet tall, supported by a tripod. They set up three radiation-resistant, two-man tents in a semicircle with the RDS in the center. Dr. Matfield began using the RDS. After a few seconds, he spoke up. The radiation seems to be within tolerable levels, as long as the anti-radiation shot does its job. He went over the data one last time, then slowly released the helmet latch on his EV suit. Once he had taken it all the way off, the others did the same. Well, at least these won't slow us down anymore, Sergeant Dawkins stated as he removed the last of his suit. I can't shoot efficiently contained in one either. I wouldn't recommend going very far, though, Dr. Matfield warned. This only detects radiation within a few miles. After that, it can be much worse. All right, team, John said, here are your assignments. Dr. Matfield, stay here and monitor the radiation. Let us know if anything changes. Sergeant Walker, stay here and guard the doctor just in case. The rest of us will search the surrounding area for signs of life. Sergeants Jones and Dawkins, you will begin searching to the north. Sergeant Harper and I will begin searching to the south. Stay within sight of the camp at all times. If you run into any trouble, whatever it may be, report it over your communicators. Does anybody have any questions? After a moment of silence, he continued. Good. All right, team, let's get moving. They split up into their two-man teams and began searching the area. Sam Dawkins and Tiffany Jones had been good friends for many years. They'd grown up together in the same district of New Haven. Over the past year, they had grown closer. Since their parents were good friends, their relationship was never a romantic one, but more like a sibling relationship. Tiff viewed Sam as a big brother, and he saw her as his little sister. As they walked, they quipped back and forth about what they would tell people when they got back to the city. When they were about a mile from camp, they came upon some buildings, destroyed in the disaster. This must be part of the old military base, Tiff stated. Yeah, Sam replied. Let's check out some of them. We might find a souvenir to take back to the city. Like what? You don't actually expect to find something valuable here, do you? Value is relative. You never know what someone will buy. Just don't get your hopes up. The most you're likely to find here is sand and rocks. They examined a few of the buildings. They appeared to be office buildings, but they were so covered in sand and rubble that nearly half a story was buried. As they were leaving one of the buildings, Sam suddenly stopped. Did you hear that? He asked. Hear what? Tiff retorted. I thought I heard something move in the rubble, Sam stated in a slightly uncomfortable tone. It's probably just the wind, Tiff reassured him. What wind? He asked. I've had an uneasy feeling since we got here, like we're being watched. We should keep going, Tiff responded. We have a lot of ground to cover. They left the buildings and kept walking. Meanwhile, Lieutenant Williams and Sergeant Harper were searching to the south with not much luck. Doesn't look like there's much here, sir, Sergeant Harper commented almost rudely. I don't think we'll find any signs of life. You may be right, John agreed, ignoring Harper's lack of respect. Just keep searching. We may find a pool with moss or something. 
gray moss, Sergeant Harper said sarcastically. No chance it'd be radioactive man-eating moss, would it? Sorry, Mike, John said. No blowing up the moss. We need a sample to take back to New Haven. Fine, Mike sighed, and then grinned at the thought of an exploding moss monster. As they kept walking, John got the uneasy feeling that someone, or something, was watching them. Sir, I have the pulse ready. Their shields will be down for a few minutes, but I can't guarantee how long. Also, our own systems will be disabled. Ensign Durham's fingers were flying over the console. We'll just have to rely on our pilots. Commander Skimore replied. Activate the energy pulse. Gary pressed a few more buttons. There was a crackling sound as the energy built up around the station, and then the lights went out. A few seconds later, the emergency power kicked in and everything lit up again, although dimmer than normal. What's the status of the enemy shields? Commander Skimore inquired. The enemy shields are down, except for the mothership. It must be on a different frequency, Gary reported. That's all right. It doesn't seem to be heavily armed anyway. Skimore replied. Lieutenant Jarvis, what's the status of our fighters? We've lost three more, and we're outnumbered ten to one. However, she paused. What is it, Lieutenant? Skimore pressed. Gary, check the enemy's weapons, she ordered. I have reports they're not doing nearly as much damage now. Gary pressed a few buttons and then reported. Their weapons weren't affected by the pulse. I'm not sure why they... He stopped, lost in thought. Suddenly, he got an idea. Ha! I see! What is it, Ensign? Skimore asked with a very serious tone. Their shields didn't only defend their ships, Gary stated, but they seemed to amplify their weapon fire as well. Their shields act like a lens, compressing their plasma burst into a tighter beam, which loses less plasma through the vacuum. Commander Skimore turned to face the viewscreen. So they're nearly defenseless? It seems your pulse was well worth it, Ensign Durham. Good work. Thank you, sir, Gary said, but this battle isn't won yet. Our fighters are making a comeback, Lieutenant Jarvis reported. We're now only outnumbered three to one. Sir, Gary yelled anxiously. The enemy mothership is moving away. The enemy fighters are docking and its hyper jump engine is powering up. They're retreating, Skimore asked. Yes, sir. They seem to be, Gary replied. Amanda's console beat. Sir, she said. We're receiving a transmission from the alien mothership. I've linked the translator to the view screen. On screen, Lieutenant, Skimore commanded. The view screen showed the face of a different but still disturbing Skrikashik. This one appeared more female by human terms and had slightly larger eyes. It appeared to be in a large round room. As it spoke in its long, drawn-out words, its face began to turn a slight shade of blue. At the bottom of the screen, large subtitles appeared as the alien spoke. Your violation will not go unpunished. We will return, and your puny race shall perish. The screen flickered back to the starfield, and the mothership winked out of view. Recall the fighters, Skimore said in a stern voice as he stood up. Have a list of casualties sent to my office. He walked to a doorway in the back of the room and left the command center. After the commander had left, Gary turned to Sub-Lieutenant Jarvis and said, Well, that could have gone better. At least they're gone for now. As the fighters returned to the station, there was what seemed to be a sigh of relief from the entire station. This battle was over, but the war had just begun. Dr. Matfield was sitting on some debris in the campsite, which they had pulled over for a seat. He was checking the status of the RDS when Sergeants Jones and Dawkins returned from their search. It was getting dark and there had been no sign of life. What's for dinner? asked Sam Dawkins as he walked over to the fire which Sergeant Walker had built from the renewable logs they had brought. Beans and dogs, Sergeant Walker responded. Just like you like them. I've never really liked hot dogs, Tiff said. I love them, Sam retorted. As they began to eat, Lieutenant Williams and Sergeant Harper returned as well. Welcome back, sir, said Sergeant Walker. Would you care for some dogs? Sounds great, Luke, John answered. Let's eat. After they ate, they went to their tents and tried to get some sleep. After about two hours, Michael Harper sat up in his sleeping bag. Did you hear that? He asked John. Hear what? John replied groggily. 
There's someone outside, Mike said. It's just your imagination, John reassured him. Go back to sleep. Just then, from outside, they heard a scream. That sounded like Tiffany, John exclaimed as he hastily got out of his sleeping bag. Now are you going to say it's my imagination? Harper snorted as they left the tent. The scene outside was hectic. With their flashlights, they could barely make out the shape of what appeared to be a dozen human-like creatures. Two of them were dragging what was unmistakably the thrashing body of Sergeant Jones. Let go of me! She screamed. Four of the creatures were coming towards John and Mike. The rest were clawing at Dr. Matfield and Sergeant Walker's tent. Suddenly, a blast of plasma came out of one of the tents and impacted on one of the creatures carrying Tiffany. Sergeant Dawkins exited his tent, carrying his plasma rifle. Get away from her! He shouted. Incoming! Yelled Sergeant Harper as he threw a stun grenade at the four creatures approaching them. The grenade flashed with a bright light and the four suddenly fell over. John fired a few pulse shots at them with his pulse pistol, but missed. Out from the last tent, Sergeant Walker emerged with a saber in one hand and a dagger in the other. Loud clanging sounds rang out as flashing blades and slashing claws met. Luke began to finesse his way around the battlefield, slashing one creature's gut splayed open. He stabbed at another, which clutched his chest as the sword pierced his heart. Luke's blades were taking them out, one at a time, and then six more of them emerged from the rubble. As they approached Sergeant Walker, two of them were hit with a plasma burst from Sam's rifle. They fell over in pain as they died. We can't hold out! There's too many of them! yelled Lieutenant Williams. Fall back! The only people who joined the retreat were Lieutenant Williams, Sergeant Harper, and Sergeant Dawkins. Luke was surrounded, unable to follow the retreat order, so he took out as many as he could. As they retreated, Sergeant Harper threw two grenades at the pursuing enemy. As he did, one of the creatures caught one and flung it back at them, something a normal human wouldn't be able to do. It exploded in the air near the retreating team. Sergeant Harper and Dawkins were caught in the blast, but the other grenade took out the pursuing creatures. As John ran, he couldn't hear anything. The blood rushing to his head drowned out the sound of battle. After running for what seemed like hours, he found his way to a near-intact building. He got inside and hid. His mind was a blur, filled with terror and panic. It swam with the images of his teams, of those creatures. He curled up into a ball and trembled himself into unconsciousness. The next morning, he awoke underneath a table, covered in dirt. He had fallen asleep while hiding. He left the building when light came. He retraced his steps back to the camp. There, he found the body of Sergeant Dawkins, what was left of it anyway. When he got back to the camp, he also found the body of Sergeant Walker, ripped to shreds. Dr. Matfield, Sergeant Harper, and Sergeant Jones were nowhere to be seen. He hoped that they had fared better than the rest of the team. He buried the bodies of his dead comrades and took their ID badges with him. He packed up what food and water he could carry and headed back towards the evacuation tunnel. He was about halfway to the tunnel when he saw, in the sky, a flash and a small spaceship streak across the sky. What was that? He thought aloud. The ship impacted the sand with a loud crash about half a mile away. He began walking towards the ship, hoping that whoever or whatever was in it, would be able to help him find the other three members of his team. Thank you for listening to this chapter of Invasion Orion. I'm Know-It-All DM. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, hit the like button. And if you want to hear more, go ahead and subscribe. As always, y'all have a good day now.